Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mirror David. David, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure. Uh, so my name is David Harrisville, and I'm a historian of uh, the Second World War and modern Germany. I'm also author of uh, this book I have right here, The Virtuous Wehrmacht, uh, Crafting the Myth of the German Soldier on the Eastern Front. Uh, and I uh, have been a historian for a long time, majored in history at Carleton College, and then uh, got my master's and PhD uh, in European history from uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, which I believe is playing Ohio State tonight. Uh, and I'm not, not too optimistic, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, Could you tell me a little bit about what your book's about and um, why you got interested in writing about something like this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess I'll start with the how I got interested part. Um, it's really, uh, it goes back to kind of a childhood fascination with World War II, um, and especially the German side. Um, you know, I grew up playing with little plastic soldiers, uh, made lots of model tanks and airplanes. I have like an embarrassingly large collection of kind of World War II stuff from when I was a kid. Um, started reading uh, like Stephen Ambrose and a lot of uh, kind of popular histories of World War II, especially um, like D-Day and the American side and watching, you know, Saving Private Ryan and kind of your like stereotypical World War II history. The good stuff. Um, yeah, the good stuff. Um, but I, I also uh, was always really interested in uh, the bad guys of World War II. Like I, I feel like the Americans and the French and the British kind of makes sense right like they're fighting for freedom they're fighting against adolf hitler um you know why wouldn't anyone do that um but i've always been curious about like what are the bad guys thinking like why were they fighting what's going through their heads um and uh during graduate school i uh, wrote my master's on chaplains in the german army um, which I thought was really weird that the Germans had chaplains because like, you know, Hitler wasn't exactly a big friend of religion, um, but um, they had a few hundred chaplains. And so I got into kind of the moral and the religious dimensions of the war and trying to understand kind of the psychology of the bad guys. Um, and I wanted to broaden that out to look at the average, if there wasn't such a thing, the average German soldier and uh, kind of the moral self-image and self-understanding of this soldier who is fighting a war. And my book is about the Eastern Front. So it's about the invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, where the Germans committed all kinds of atrocities. Uh, the German army, regular army, was a big part of the Holocaust in many different ways. Um, so in the book, I try to understand what did these soldiers think about themselves on kind of a moral level? Um, like, how did they understand what they were doing? Um, did they b really believe in their cause on a moral level? Um, and how do you explain um, their self-image? Um, so I basically find that most of them believe that they were the good guys. Um, so if that's true, how did they possibly come up with this image while they are murdering um, thousands, if not millions, of innocent people uh, on the Eastern Front. Um, so it's really about this kind of like taking apart the German soldier in a kind of moral and psychological way, uh, mostly using letters uh, that the soldiers sent, and then also trying to understand the army as a whole and its its kind of moral, um, like the moral worldviews that shaped what the army was doing. Where, I guess, when it comes to the average mindset of a German soldier, what was the average mindset like of someone that was doing these actions? And then what are the outliers? I mean, 
I would have to think, cause like I told you off air that I've read diaries of German soldiers. A lot of people that were fearful that if they didn't perform an order or if they didn't do something that their family was going to be the one on the receiving end, or they were going to be on the receiving end of the same exact thing. So it was like, you're either going to do it or we're going to make you and your family suffer. And I would just think that people that would be enjoying this type of thing had to be someone that really wasn't paying the price or the one that was performing the act, obviously being a little bit distant from the argument. It's funny you mentioned the religion thing, though, and Hitler not being a big fan of that, because there's a interesting article um, you can look up. It was a thing that almost happened where Hitler tried to get rid of Christmas and he was able to take yes, Santa Claus yeah, he away. Tried to kind of replace it with Nazi Christmas, essentially. Yes. But he couldn't uh, beat Jesus. And I just always thought that was interesting because I didn't know I, I, for, for a lot of us. And it's, it's hard because I bet going into this book, you probably had some original thoughts that you learned about history, mostly taught from the American side of things. And whenever you get to the point of saying not all Nazis were like bad Nazis, people say, are you defending that? It's like, well, you have to start putting that in a little bit more context. But I'm curious, what was the average? mindset like so uh the thing that really surprised me the most and um is kind of at the heart of the book is the finding that uh, most of the soldiers uh the, the ones i studied were very convinced that they were the good guys um that they were fighting for a kind of righteous cause that that what they were doing which included genocide like burning down villages executing everybody um all kinds of untold crimes um, they still uh, largely held to this conviction that they were decent guys, that they were honorable, their side was honorable, and this was a kind of righteous war that they were fighting against the Soviet Union, um, which, you know, how do you, how do you explain that, right? How, how could people possibly believe this? Um, and in terms of the, the fear aspect, so what I found um, generally, I did not really run into soldiers who were so afraid of what would happen to their families or, you know, what would happen if they didn't follow orders. Um, it was more um, almost the opposite, like guys who were convinced of what they were doing, um, that this was actually acceptable behavior, uh, even the crimes that they're committing, um, who are able to rationalize what they're doing in all sorts of ways. Um, even without that that factor. And certainly there was a lot of fear, right? Like most, most of these guys were drafted into the army. They weren't volunteers. Um, it's a pretty you know, rigid military machine. You're supposed to follow orders. You're supposed to do what, you know, what you're told. Um, but what was kind of remarkable to me is, is the, just the extent to which they um, so willingly went along with this. Um, not just out of fear, but out of the kind of conviction that what they were doing was was actually uh, morally acceptable or correct. Was it did did you weigh the options of like what could maybe like not really brainwashing, but just like propaganda? I mean, and a lot of propaganda leads back to demonizing one side so much where you lose the human aspect of another human being that you're fighting. It just I mean. Half the time you're reading history books, it's like, no, shoot him, shoot him. It's the enemy. It's like, well, hang on. You're not taking account for anything past that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I look at a, a number of different kind of um, psychological influences on the soldiers and propaganda is a big one. Um, so the Nazi regime uh, worked very diligently to uh, indoctrinate its men, especially in the army, and of course, throughout the whole society, um, with the idea that they were members of a superior race um, that was kind of at war with inferior races, the Jews being kind of the worst of the worst, um, and uh, kind of created this idea that it was the responsibility and the duty of the German soldier to go out and exterminate or enslave or dominate um, these other inferior races, especially in, in Eastern Europe, take their land uh, and use it for German purposes. And uh, that indoctrination happens in lots of different ways. Um, soldiers are kind of bombarded with like reading materials and uh, lectures and uh, the Nazis kind of rewrite the regulations that the soldiers are, are supposed to follow. They issue orders. Um, like in the Eastern Front, there's this uh, particular set of orders called the criminal orders. 
that are issued right before the war begins against the Soviet Union that basically say, um, this isn't going to be a regular war. This is an ideological war. Um, we're not, we're going to show no mercy toward the Soviets. They're inferior. Uh, we're not going to follow the rules of war anymore. Uh, we're not going to take care of Soviet prisoners uh, according to international law and that sort of thing. Um, so soldiers are certainly subjected to all of these different ideas uh, coming at them, you know, from, from pretty much every angle. Um, but on top of that, uh, another thing I find is um, those weren't the only ideas in the Wehrmacht. Um, so a lot of these soldiers grew up, you know, pretty, they were pretty young when the Third Reich began, but they could remember back to a time before the Third Reich um, and their upbringing included um, all kinds of different moral ideas that are older than Nazism. Um, so religion, Christianity, for example, very influential in Germany at the time. Um, you've got these kind of traditional moral values, traditional nationalism, patriotism, duty, honor, sacrifice, um, ideas about uh, chivalry and what a good soldier is supposed to be like, middle class values about the value of hard work and honesty and cleanliness and that sort of thing. Um, and so uh, one kind of point I make in the book is soldiers were able, you could kind of choose like the Nazi path and say, you know, I'm fighting for Hitler and I'm fighting for Nazism to destroy the inferior races. But if you weren't comfortable with that, and not all soldiers were comfortable with that, you had this other set of options that you could choose from uh, to rationalize your behavior, to still make it kind of morally acceptable to you. Um, and I'm happy to kind of get into all those different uh, sorts of methods. Yeah, it was um, it was something I was going to ask, which was like, I can only think of one thing that would give you this mindset of considering another human being inferior. And it would my biggest example would be like maybe religion is where I've common I've seen a lot of examples of. I think there's more now today. People have even boiled that into politics, whether what side you choose, whether they want to listen to you or not. And it's just it was this like a start of it. I mean, if you're having these people, I mean. I think everyone starts to think that, that all these people believed in what Hitler was saying, but when you start examining the other path where people had to justify it to themselves morally, maybe they didn't follow the idea of just believing in Hitler, but they had to maybe make an excuse to themselves on religious purposes or this sense of patriotism. I mean, that power and patriotism is really something which is interesting. I have never, ever really heard it connected with Germany before. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the there's this long nationalist patriotic tradition that goes back uh, really to the founding of Germany, um, the idea of dying for the fatherland, uh, doing your duty, that sort of thing uh, is definitely, definitely see, you see a lot of German soldiers writing about that. Um, yeah, in terms of your sort of other options. Um, so of course, you know, you have hardcore Nazis um, who are absolutely fine with murdering people because they are biologically inferior according to they drink coffee black yes they drink the, coffee. yes they drink the black coffee um but then you have other guys so yeah religion is one of the uh, major rationalizations that i write about i have a whole chapter about uh crusading so the soviet union was officially an atheist country right communist um, Stalin and Lenin had shut down most of the churches in the country, um, kind of gotten rid of the priests, killed a lot of them. And uh, when the Germans rolled in, uh, part of the propaganda, even coming from the Nazis themselves, which is kind of weird, um, is that we are on a crusade. This isn't just a, you know, an ideological racial war. This is a religious crusade. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna get rid of the atheist communists, and we're gonna bring back religion to uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, one of the craziest things that happens in the campaign, um, which I write about in my book, but I also wrote a separate article about it, is uh, German soldiers reopen churches that the Soviets had closed as the German army moves into Russia. Um, so, like they'll they'll go into a church with the German chaplain, uh, clean it up, um, sometimes bring in the civilian population to help out with that, and then hold services 
sometimes together with with Russians or Ukrainians, <clears throat> and um, kind of declare that the Germans have brought religion back uh, to the Soviet Union. Hitler was not happy <laughs> when he heard about this, um, by the way. Um, so that's this kind of religious crusade is one uh, one of several of these big kind of rationalizations that I talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Rebuilding churches. I mean, for me, when you said that, I was just thinking like that has to be something for when people see it or maybe people who are hardcore religious on the other side to get involved in helping was because they believe in more than that than their political ideology or their communist views or whatever they separate on. Because that is a powerful thing, this belief factor. I'm, I'm sure when you were reading letters and you were doing, you know, looking through research for your book and stuff, you probably came across some just interesting perspectives that really never get talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And the religious angle has kind of been ignored uh, by historians in the Wehrmacht. A lot of people think like, well, you know, it was such a Nazified army. No one was really, you know, Christian anymore, something like that. Uh, I kind of find the opposite. Like I, I found a number of soldiers who were really um, deeply Christian or saw themselves as such. Um and uh, they wrote very directly saying, like, this is why I believe in this war is because I want to bring, bring religion to Russia, uh, which is very disturbing. Like, I happen to be Christian myself. and <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I'm not comfortable at all uh, with people using, you know, using religion in that way. But it absolutely happened uh, in the Wehrmacht. Um, another um, big rationalization that I talk about is liberation. Um, so in addition to this idea of that we're bringing religion back, a lot of the soldiers write about the idea that we are kind of rescuing people from the evil communist system. Um, we're like getting, and to be fair, you know, Joseph Stalin, murderous dictator in his own right. Um, there are plenty of reasons to, you know, to hate the Soviet regime. And when the Germans came in, uh, they talked a lot about how we are liberating people and we're freeing you from communism. We're going to make life better for you. You know, they put up posters telling people you're going to get your land back. We're getting rid of the collective farms. Um, and you have individual soldiers uh, handing out candy to people. Um, they write about like chopping down firewood so old ladies can survive the winter. Um, all these little gestures of showing the, you know, the goodwill of the German soldier um, at the same time that they are basically committing genocide, which is this, you know, this very strange combination. Um, so this liberation idea was alongside the crusade idea was yet another way of, for soldiers to kind of believe in their cause and turn it from a you know, essentially an act of genocide into this righteous project. Did you see the propaganda on any of this stuff when it came to myths about the German soldier get turned up at all? Like, I feel like what you just described immediately, it's like, that's to a population who doesn't really know what's going on with the German army. It doesn't have a vision of them painted yet where I start, I start looking at our own propaganda against them. And I mean, they were pictures and posters of them like blood dripping from their mouth and just demonish features where I go, there's the religion aspect again. But also if you demonize them so much, when a wolf comes over to you wearing sheep's clothing, you'll be aware of it, which it makes sense of why maybe the propaganda was so high up there. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the Soviet population, um, so a lot of, a lot of them didn't really know what to expect, right. From the Germans necessarily, uh, some of them remember back to World War I. In World War I, Germany occupied a pretty big swath of Russia, actually. And um, they, were, they were bad, but they weren't so bad. Uh, so a lot of Russians thought, well, these people can't be worse than Joseph Stalin. Like, it, you know, we've millions of people starved in Ukraine through the famine and uh, a lot of farmers, especially. Like, in the city, you had more support for the Soviet regime and the countryside, uh, many, many people um, welcomed the Germans and threw flowers at them and were hoping the Germans would, would really improve their situation. They, like you said, they didn't really know what to expect, but they were hoping for something better. 
Um, and in, in terms of the demonization, um, certainly, you know, both sides were doing it to each other. Um, on the German side, what's interesting to me is, is the way that the Germans portrayed uh, the Soviets. So there's this kind of like bifurcated um, way the German propaganda worked. On the one hand, the Soviets are are portrayed as inferior, as basically animals, like you were saying, um, as people who are beneath us. Like we can squash them like bugs. It doesn't matter. We we shouldn't care about them whatsoever. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, uh, German propaganda also kind of portrayed the average Soviet farmer as a victim of Joseph Stalin, that we're maybe going to come and, and help this, this poor guy um, and, you know, and liberate him from, from communism. Um, so there's, it's, it's, they kind of waffle back and forth between, you know, the Soviets are animals and, oh, poor, you know, these poor guys, especially the civilians, we're gonna, we're gonna be, be better than the last rulers um, of Russia. What you're doing is a good thing, not a bad thing. What you're doing is a good thing, not a bad thing. Exactly. It's, it's kind of appealing to soldiers of different mindsets. And that's really like one of the main themes of the book is the German army did a really good job appealing to uh, many different perspectives of soldiers in its ranks. Like, oh, you're you're a religious guy. Well, we have a crusade for you. Um, you know, do you want to feel better about what you're doing? Uh, then you can be a liberator, right? You can you can take this other path. You want to be a Nazi? Like, oh, we've got you know plenty of propaganda for you too. Um, so the the army is able to kind of like speak out of different sides of its mouth to different audiences in its own ranks. Did you ever come across anything where people were having conflicts on maybe their views towards their religious belief compared to their view with just Hitler in general? Like, I feel like is the main narrative or the main people that followed that they actually believed in what Hitler was doing. Cause I've seen some propagandas on the other side during world war II when it came to Hitler, just being painted all over the whole poster. And he's like holding like, United States in his hand, or he's holding Soviet Russia in his hand. And he's such this giant figure where I start going, I mean, there's posters you can look up of Jesus covering the whole photo and covering the world or something like that. I'm like, they're portraying him in a sense of like a God. And I think that's where you start seeing the mentality of trying to cancel Christmas and stuff of that sort. Yeah. Um, so what I find the majority of the guys that I study really, um, seem to have believed in this stuff. Um, even the Christians, which, you know, I find particularly disturbing. Um, even Christian soldiers will write about the atrocities that their side commits and still somehow be okay with it. In fact, um, it seems like most of them didn't really see a big contradiction between following Hitler and being Christian, um, which is scary. But um, there were a few who actually started to question. Um, and have you seen the, it's, I think it's Monty Python sketch, Are We the Baddies? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like that. Like, there are actually a couple of them uh, who wrote in their letters, which is rather, rather dangerous because there was censorship, so they could have gotten caught. Um, but there are a couple of guys who really started to question whether or not they were even fighting on the right side. Um, partly for religious reasons, like there's one um, one guy, Heinz Rahe, who's a, a very you know dedicated Catholic who reads all about Nazi persecution of the churches in Germany and in the army itself and starts to think like, wait a second, uh, maybe we're not really the crusaders. <laughs> like maybe I'm fighting for this guy who's actually destroying religion. Um, there's another guy um, who wrote a, a kind of ambiguous letter saying that he feels ashamed to be German because of what was happening to the Jews. Um, and he doesn't really go into the details of like what he witnessed, but he makes a kind of a veiled reference to the Holocaust. Um, so there were soldiers who, who started to question. There's another guy in particular, um, uh, Harold, 
who uh, his letters are all about the atrocities that the Germans committed on like a daily basis. Um, and he had a very guilty conscience. Like he wrote about, um, you know, killing civilians, stealing their property, stealing their last, like, in one case, there's a lady and her two kids, or maybe it's more than two, in the middle of winter, and he, and Harold and uh, and his comrades steal her last potatoes, and he knows that this basically is going to kill her. Um, and he wrote these very, like, kind of guilt-stricken letters home um, that I had the chance to read, um, but he still somehow managed to go along with it. Like he would always come up with some kind of reason why this was still okay. Like, oh, well, you know, my comrades and I were really hungry. We had to eat these potatoes, even though I feel bad about it. Or, um, you know, the Soviets, the Soviets are so terrible that it's okay for us to steal their equipment, you know, from the prisoners and then the prisoners are going to starve or, or, uh, you know, freeze to death in the winter because they took all their clothing. Uh, so there was, on the one hand, you know, a little bit of questioning about the German cause, but on the other hand, uh, German soldiers were really, really good at rationalizing. Um, and I have, have a whole chapter about how they wrote home to their families and their moms and their dads and their sisters about the crimes that they were committing. Uh, which I think is incredible. Like I didn't expect any any of these German soldiers to write about their own crimes, um, but they do quite a bit. Um, but when they do, they always come up with with like a justification or an explanation that they can share uh, with the people back home. Did you come across any uh, rationalizations that were just like seemed like this dude's just trying to grasp for any life preserver on the boat at this point or anything that's going to keep him afloat? Like, I feel like, you know, everyone looks for reasons in something. Some people see Darth Vader in a potato chip and think it's God or something like it's, you know, there's those weak examples. Um, It's hard to say exactly like who is who's on the edge. Um, probably uh, Harold is the closest where he's he's really he's really kind of grasping um, a lot of his rationalizations have to do with with like well I'm hungry I'm cold in the winter so I'm therefore I'm stealing uh, from from innocent people it's me or them uh, mentality yeah it's me or them which is you know as a moral argument it's stronger than a lot of the other ones um, that other people make um, a lot of them write about how uh, the Soviets did it first. Um, like, well, we executed some some prisoners today. Um, you're not supposed to do that. But, you know, these guys were so evil. They were shooting us in the back. You know, they were breaking the rules. Therefore, it's acceptable for us to do to them what they were doing to us. Um, you have another guy who's a Protestant pastor in real life. Um, who who writes about, uh, and he's he's kind of a low-ranking officer, he writes about the crimes that his people are committing and says, uh, well, you know, it's, it's bad, but uh, war has its own morality. Uh, more, war has its own laws, and the kind of regular laws of right and wrong don't apply anymore. Um, and he, he talks, yeah, like at length about a, a pig, actually, like some of his soldiers stole a pig from some some guy and ate it. And then the civilian came to Heinz um, asking him for like justice. And he basically said, like, sorry, um, you know, he kind of felt bad, but war has its own law. Did you look into how big of an issue the censorship thing was the when the, they were writing these letters? Because I have to think, like, how many accounts do we not know of because they were afraid to write something down? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so censorship, like whenever you're looking at letters, uh, it becomes an issue. Um, so you had a kind of censorship apparatus in the German army. Um, you, there's a kind of specific group of bureaucrats that would read through, um, they couldn't read everything. So the German soldiers wrote about 10 billion letters, 
during the war. Um, and I think there are like a couple hundred censor uh, officers or bureaucrats who would read through the mail. Um, and uh, German soldiers were aware that this existed. Um, so I believe, I think you're absolutely right. There are certain topics that they just don't talk about. Um, there are things that you just don't really find in the letters because, you know, potentially they thought if, if they wrote about it, it would, you know, put them in, in a, you know, in a bad spot, or maybe their family would, you know, uh, would have repercussions on the homeland. Um, however, what's kind of interesting about this, what the censors did, they cared mostly about military secrets and soldiers like giving away their position. Um, they cared about soldiers saying bad things about Hitler. Um, they cared about soldiers um, talking about like being defeatist and saying, oh, we're losing the war and we should give up and things like that. Um, most of the, the topics that I write about in my book were not censored. Um, like the, you know, the censors were just fine if soldiers wrote about how much they believed in the war, right? Or, you know, or how they justified it. Well, that was a rationalized back home to their family members too. I mean, I have to imagine how many family members were afraid to write back like, oh my God, my son or my husband is doing these horrendous things. And he's, and you could probably tell, especially if you know the person, like that they're obviously struggling with something. Like if someone's talking about, well, it was going to be me or them, you know, is it a battle or you're talking about taking food? You start going like, is this the person that I knew when they went there to go do whatever they had to do? Yeah, and a lot of um, a lot of my book is is kind of looking at the uh, like how soldiers filter their experiences for their readers on the homeland. Um, so the like the version of events that people get through these letters isn't necessarily the truth. It's kind of what the soldiers want their mom or their dad or whoever to believe. Um, so I think it was very important to a lot of the soldiers that they would not only talk about crimes they committed, but they would include a, an explanation or a justification. Um, so the readers in the homeland could could understand, you know, okay, yeah, that's questionable, but sounds like you're 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 going hungry, so I'm okay with it. Um, now I didn't read a whole lot of letters from the home front to the front. But uh, the ones I have are uh, pretty scary. Like the Boy. the kind of conclusion I've come to, uh, like there's a, a guy, a dad, for example, who writes to his son, Peter, saying, um, like, if you run into any any partisans, any Soviet, res like civilian resistors, uh, shoot first and don't ask questions, basically. Jesus, um, he never showed up to a baseball game, but he was happy to write that letter, wasn't he? Yeah, um, there are other ones. They're like uh, really disturbing letters of of Germans asking, basically, like asking their soldiers to steal stuff for them. Um, people saying like, "Oh, could you send home uh, a nice scarf to me from Russia, or could you send me like fox fur or or food or whatever it is?" And so it's like people on the home front kind of become complicit in, in a certain extent in these crimes because they're like asking soldiers they don't necessarily say oh please steal something for me but they'll say oh you know could you send me home you know some some stuff from russia and then soldiers will would do that i think that's a natural thing though too i think that's with everybody i think if there's even trophy weapons are illegal you can't collect another person's weapon in battle and use it as your own or claim it as like a trophy or a prize or something like that it's just usually it's different it catches somebody's eye but i mean it's like a human instinct thing to just want something that maybe you see someone else that they have i'm not rationalizing i'm just saying i think yeah 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 absolutely um no you see you know the spoils of war being mailed home uh to family members um but i i think the the kind of bottom line about the home front that i uh that i came to the conclusion of is uh, the home front basically writes a kind of blank check to their soldiers. Uh, like you do whatever you want, whatever you need to do to survive. We're okay with that. 
the home front also seems to accept the rationalizations and the explanations that the soldiers give. Um, I haven't come across a single case of, uh, of someone on the home front saying, you know, wow, what you're doing sounds really terrible. Like you were, you, you've turned into a monster. Um, it's more like um, people kind of understanding that, you know, yes, the, the soldiers are, you know, crossing some lines to put it mildly, but they seem to accept the explanations and the rationalizations. Um, and, and in fact, that feeds this myth about the the cleanliness and the decency of the German army that will go on to uh, kind of dominate German society up until just about the year 2000, um, because people were so convinced that, you know, their their husbands or their sons or whoever it was um, had remained decent people uh, throughout the conflict. When it, I, I know it's probably got to be a tough subject to write about, too. I mean, you're looking at the other side as well, too, and you're trying. I mean, for historical reasons, do you find that your perspective, anything throughout history before going in and writing the book and doing your research has changed at all? I mean, besides just learning more about the German side, but obviously you look at just war a little bit differently. Uh, that's a really, really good question. I hope. Um, I guess when I when I came into the project, um, I came in with a certain number of preconceptions, mostly based on um, all of the other books that I'd read before I started doing my research. So I did this big kind of project to see, okay, what have other historians said about the German army? Um, and uh, I'll give a couple highlights. You know, there's a, a great number of uh, studies talking about the crimes of the German army. That is, you know, absolutely irrefutable um, at this point, just how how genocidal um, this organization was. Um, and another uh, another thing that is really a big part of the scholarship is Nazi ideology. Um, and so when I went into the archives, I was expecting to find that like every soldier is a Nazi, pretty much. Um, I expected all the propaganda to be purely Nazi. Um, just talking about, you know, inferior races and superior races and biology uh, and Lebensraum um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and I was really surprised to find so many soldiers who um, didn't necessarily seem to be such dedicated Nazis, um, but they're still committing the same crimes as the more hardcore Nazis and still finding a way somehow to get to this point where they can sleep at night, essentially. Um, so I, I basically, I found the army to be a little less Nazi than I think it's been made out to be, but scarier. Uh, and I think it's it's scarier because it was able to um, to kind of appeal to such a wide range of soldiers, even the ones who um, who didn't really see themselves as big followers of Hitler um, or big like racial warriors or whatever. Um, so I, I kind of think like it took. It's almost like if you had a pure, like absolutely pure evil Nazi ideology and that is the only thing that is fueling the army i don't think it would have actually worked very well i think a lot of soldiers just psychologically wouldn't have been able to go along with that um like it's just too it's too much it's too off the beaten path of morality but uh the army was able to still mix in these other values like hey you want to be a crusader okay, you can be a crusader as long as you go along with everything. Um, so I, that, that is one kind of major surprise to me is um, because from what I had read from other historians, I, I just thought, okay, I, everybody's a Nazi. And that's, that's kind of the big explanation here. Um, I guess in terms of seeing war differently, 
Um, that's a really good question. I also want to ask about the rationale. Like, did you think that a lot of it was justified in a sense, or do you think like when it, not, not obviously not the acts, but just the rationality aspects of things. I mean, do you think everyone kind of overall agreed and were happy with what they were doing? It's a little bit different than what I asked earlier, only because when you look at rationale, you can get perspective of two things. You can look at it like this person is rationalizing to themselves these horrible acts that they're doing. Or are you looking at these person are just trying to justify this to everyone else to get the message as well, too? Like if you're writing letters to your family member, you're not only confirming your bias, you're confirming exactly that onto your others as well, too. And I'm, I'm pretty sure back in Germany, the families were probably able to see magazines and newspapers or something that was saying the message. But you'll be able to tell this person is definitely not happy with what's going on, but they also kind of are going with it, you know? Yeah, uh, I think you're absolutely right about the these kind of two different directions. It's like you're rationalizing it for yourself, but you're writing letters and the letters are going home to somebody else. Uh, and so you are, you know, you're providing an explanation or a rationalization for an audience. Tell me right? if what I'm doing is OK in your eyes. I I think there is a lot of that. And we do that know, with and, text. Whenever someone says Netflix and chill, you know, you wait for an emoji to come through and it'll be the yes or no emoji, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I do think they're, they're kind of hoping for some confirmation, um, you know, on, on, on some sort of level. Well, cause you gotta look, I'm going to be returning home when I do, am I going to be accepted back in the home? that I was once accepted to when I left. And I mean, I think that's a interesting point to bring up. I mean, these guys are away from their families for so long, not only missing them and then also doing this, but their only line of communication is through a letter and they don't know if tomorrow they're going to receive one, whether one was sent or not, or whether they're going to be alive to be able to read it. And I think that's a very, you know, they don't really see that get talked about a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Um, and I mean, in terms of, of like, do I buy the rationalizations? I guess on one level, it's sort of impossible to tell if these guys really believed what they're writing in their letters. That That's just one thing. Like as a historian, you can read the letters, you can read other people's letters, you can do comparisons, you can read other people's books. Um, at the end of the day, I don't know exactly if, you know, if these, if they really believed what they wrote. Um, I, some of them, it seems like they did more than others, perhaps. Um, but in general, um, no, I don't think, um, you know, I, I think in, in like 95, 99% of cases, uh, what they did was absolutely not justified, um, even by the standards of the time. Um, I, I think the strongest rationalizations definitely had to do with um, with those cases when German soldiers were lacking supplies themselves, like in the winter of 1941, the army was not ready for the winter whatsoever and uh, like didn't have enough, you know, winter clothing, uh, didn't have enough food, the supply lines are stretched to the limit, and you saw a lot of theft by German soldiers. Um, you know, in the, you could potentially make an argument that, you know, it was either they survive or, you know, the Soviet civilians or prisoners survive. And um, that's a kind of difficult moral choice. Um, Did you ever trace any of these letters? Um, see what happened when these people returned home? Like, did you follow anybody, look them up or see what happened if they, I have to feel like someone at one point had to start writing poetry or start a, 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 a sheep farm or do something that happens to be the complete opposite of what they were involved in. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, in most cases, no. Well, so about a third of them die before the war ends. Um, there were a few guys who had letters that went after the war, but I I didn't really have time to look into that, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know a whole lot about their, you know, their careers after the war. That, that would be very fascinating, though. Um, and like, you know, did some of them kind of repent and try to make up for what they did, you know, in some way or... 
I've I've uh, read some yeah. accounts and heard some stories about people that I mean we're in charge of like the MK Ultra project. That's a horrible mind altering experiment and and you hear like this guy's out in the woods like with a farm and he's just like just living out and just doesn't talk just listens to po writes poetry and listens to music and you're just like this is the complete opposite person from what I'm reading through the historical record and the documents. And you just get this new like thing. It's like, oh, you probably experience a lot of pain. It's also the mindset. I mean, it's that blind act of patriotism. What will people do to justify their actions? I mean, you can look at a lot of stuff with like Vietnam and the calls that were made and they just go, you know, I got to do it because no other American will. And it's like, OK, this guy might be painted bad, but also the way he's thinking about it is not normal. That is not it's either someone that might have convinced themselves to do the acts that they have to do. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, even though I don't look at, at really what these guys said after the war, um, I do look at what they said and what they did during the war. And maybe I mentioned this already, but um, there are a lot of them who emphasize that they're giving out candy to children, or they're sharing cigarettes with prisoners, or there's, they're doing these little, I call them like redemptive gestures. Um, they're not they're not like actually making up for all the people they have murdered uh, potentially, but um, by giving someone a cigarette or sharing some food or something like that, I think it, it's kind of salving their consciences. Um, like there's this um, psychologist, I, I started reading a lot of psychology um, to help me uh, with the book and um, there's a guy named Claude Steele um, who uh, came up with this theory called self-affirmation theory, which says that most people uh, want to see themselves as good. And um, if you do something bad that goes against your self-image, you can kind of like make up for it by doing some little nice thing. And the nice thing doesn't have to be huge. Um, and so on the Eastern Front, I think uh, you see a lot of that, of soldiers writing about how they reopen churches and they feel really good about it. Um, they, they reopen, they open prisons, actually, and let prisoners go free because they're supposedly liberating people. Um, they gave bread to strangers, even though it was going against regulations. But um, those are these like tiny little things that help them feel like I haven't become a monster. Like I'm still, I'm still a good person. What, was there, was there anything like myth wise that you heard that was actually confirmed of like something that they did? I just feel like if you're talking about rebuilding churches and doing these types of things, I feel like at one point somebody was going, what are you doing? He's like, I'm rebuilding the church. Like we said we were going to do. No, no, no. That was just something we said. We're not actually doing that. We're just doing something completely different. Uh, what do, what do you mean by myth wise? Like, I, I mean, it could be a bad thing. It can be a good thing. I mean, you're coming at it from, you're learning the other perspective when you're doing this work. So, I mean, you're already told, and I think most Americans are told a history version of it that does not look into this light of this situation. You, know, you hear myths of them drinking blood or something like that. They're war myths, but you start going in there is like, how much of this is like, obviously they probably heard some of the propaganda too, but when you're looking into what that word propaganda is, I mean, was any of them confirmed to be true? Were they all like, you just, like you just mentioned with the cigarette giving that, I mean, you can look at it like a person's like, you already lost a lot. I'm not going to make it even worse. You know, I might as well try and connect on some human level. So obviously they're not cold and heartless people there are moments where they had these moments of human in them which is new um well so really the biggest myth um is it's called the myth of the, uh, the Wehrmacht's clean hands or the the clean Wehrmacht myth um and it's the idea that the army was honorable and that the men were decent and uh, this is what people believe for decades, including in the, the United States. Um, there's, I mean, to this day, there are people who, um, who look at the German army as this kind of glorious, like, you know, amazing military machine, um, like Erwin, you think of like Erwin Rommel and, um, and the generals who tried to kill Hitler in 1944. Um, and there's this, sense that 
you know, well, the Gestapo was bad, the SS was bad, but the ordinary German soldier uh, wasn't such a bad guy. He was just kind of doing his job. Um, you know, my research and other people's research uh, completely explodes this myth um, by revealing just the extent to which, and you don't even need statistics. Like you can just read these people's letters and see what they said in their own words um, about all the civilians they killed, villages, they burned down about 70,000 villages. Um, and I did a lot of um, mapping, like digital mapping work uh, and that was made difficult because a lot of the places they talk about don't e don't exist today because they were wiped off the map. Um, uh, the Wehrmacht killed about th uh, three million Soviet prisoners of war by starving them to death, um, especially in the winter of 1941. Um, was a major contrib contributor to the Holocaust. Like there were some units that actively hunted down and murdered Jews. Um, there are others who kind of played a supporting role identifying Jews and handing them over to the SS and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, so the main, this main myth, uh, my research definitely helps to, um, to dismantle. Um, I'm trying to think of myths that are kind of true. Um, I guess one, one that comes up is um, the commissar, like the Soviet commissars. Uh, the Germans uh, executed them on site pretty much when they were captured. Um, and uh, some of the myths about them were actually true, um, that the commissars would kill their own soldiers when they tried to retreat. Um, and they certainly were, uh, you know, they they didn't deserve to be murdered by the they Germans. They were not getting a Christmas uh, necessarily, but. You know, but uh, some of the German propaganda about the commissars, you know, had a grain of truth. And in fact, you know, in a very general sense, um, one of the things that made German propaganda effective, uh, especially coming out of people like Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, is that there is always a little bit of truth uh, to the propaganda. I mean, like a lot of the the accusations the Germans make against the Soviets had some truth to them. Um, like they would investigate the crimes of the Red Army. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Katyn massacre in Poland, uh, where the Russians killed, I forget, something like 10,000 Polish officers in Eastern Poland and then tried to cover it up. Um, the German army actually discovered the site of this massacre and started researching it and and um, use that in its propaganda to say the Soviets are are terrible. Um, so you know some of some of the things the Germans accuse the Soviets of are actually true. Uh, the Soviets were were pretty terrible, um, and in fact that you know that added more fuel to the fire for the Wehrmacht to be able to say, well, uh, we're not as bad as the Soviets, right? We're morally superior we're liberators, we're coming to to make things better because my goodness, how could it be, be worse than these people? Uh, it turns out they were worse, but um, you know, when you're fighting an enemy that didn't necessarily play by the rules, it makes your own propaganda seem a little more effective. Um, so. I just got one last question for you and it's when it comes to, I know it might go against a little bit about what your book is, but did you branch out from soldiers at all? Did you get interested in looking at maybe coming across like a scientist or any single person that might have been involved in the Nazi army, but not on the front lines? Um, in this study, I really focus on on the soldiers. Um, I mean, there are some guys who were behind the lines. Um, like there's one in particular who is more of a like supply guy. So he he drives around in a in like a uh, a radio truck. I'm not even sure exactly what it is, but he, so he's doing like communication mm -hmm. uh, type of stuff or supplies um, and uh, has a pretty similar perspective to the more frontline soldiers. Like he'll write about all the uh, Soviet prisoners that he sees and talks about how they deserve what they're getting. 
Um, at one point, he writes about a Jewish cemetery. Like he sees the Warsaw Ghetto because um, he travels around Poland and talks about how like dirty the Jews are uh, and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of like scientists and stuff, um, I mean, there are other books that have been written about um, uh, something called Ostforschung, which is this kind of collection of like historians and scientists and uh, researchers who in German universities who made the the kind of argument that Eastern Europe really belonged to Germany, that the Germans are superior. There's a lot of this like biological research trying to show that Jews have, you know, biologically inferior characteristics and trying to measure like, what does a Jew look like? Who would you, who do we define as Jewish or who do you define as Slavic? Um, so there's this, you know, you have the army at the front, but you do have this whole army of other people uh, in the civilian world who are part of this project, project of extermination uh, on the Eastern Front in one way or another, um, kind of helping to come up with rationalizations and to further this, this idea of the righteous cause. You know? If you were going to write another book, uh, what would your next book be? I, I know this one came out uh, not too long ago. So I, I just curious, like, I mean, you, you pick something like this, are you going to pick like a lighter hearted topic? Or are you going to maybe dive into a different perspective on the World War II? I'm a Cold War fan, so I can understand, you know, you're a fan of being a World War II person. Um, yeah, good question. I have not completely decided yet. Um, one thing I want to write about, which maybe wouldn't be long enough for a book, it might be like an article would be um, about this uh, kind of museum exhibition that the Germans put on about the Eastern Front and about the Soviet Union. Um, and they actually like took, I think they would take like huts and houses from Russia and brought them back to Germany and then showed them in this museum exhibition about how like terrible the Soviet Union is and how, you know, the Germans are gonna make everything better um, by fighting over there. Um, so that's a little more like a home front related project. Um, in terms of a book project, still thinking about it, um, I think one thing that could be interesting is um, delving more into um, kind of what you were saying about like the scientists and the people on the home front and trying to figure out the extent to which people, um, were they really, um, did they really switch over to a new Nazi moral system or um, were they in many cases uh, working with older, more traditional moral values like Christianity or uh, whatever it might be in order to get to the same place. So the question is like, did Germans switch to a new moral system, which some historians have argued that they basically, um, you know, adopted this completely new called Nazi morality, a new way of thinking about right and wrong, or um, were they able to rationalize in a more kind of traditional sense, like a lot of the soldiers did? Um, and like, to what extent did you really need to be a Nazi in order to commit the same kinds of crimes or in order to really believe in, you know, in what the Nazis were doing? Um, so that's one potential idea. Um, it's a good one. Not, a good not one. completely sure yet. I don't even know how it would how it would work um, exactly, but uh, possibly uh, something coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, and where can people find your book and any other links that you'd like to promote? I'm uh, sure. So uh, the book is with Cornell University Press. Uh, so you can find it on their website or just uh, Google for it. Um, I've also got my own personal website, uh, davidharrisville.com. And that has um, all of the digital maps that I was talking about. Uh, in addition to more information about the book, uh, I joined Twitter pretty recently <laughs> uh, to be, you know, a bigger part of the kind of historical. There are a lot of historians on Twitter, the Twitter historians. Um, so those are, uh, yeah, a couple of, of ways you can find me. Well, I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.